Welcome to the Every Night is Game Night preview series, the show where designers and publishers share their passion and answer critical questions about their Kickstarter projects. If you're on the fence about a pledge, this is the show for you. ENG and preview series episode 30. Neverland Rescue and Groves with Dan Letzring. Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome back to the Every Night is Game Night preview series. I'm your host, Jason. Thank you so, so much for joining us. This week, we have a two-player asymmetrical game called Neverland Rescue. You know me. I, you know I love my games that are dripping with themes, so here you go is another one. Uh, I have the publisher of the game. He is... Dan Letzring of Lateman Games. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. How's it going? It's going all right. It's going all right. We were just uh, kind of going back and forth before the show, talking about our kids, talking about That's having right, to yeah. reschedule Dad stuff and everything. And burgers and all that good stuff. We uh, you, we may have to talk about top five food articles at the at the end of the jump. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. I'm down. I love food more than almost anything, so that's perfect. Uh, oh, oh, we're definitely going to do that. So stay tuned after the outro music for uh, top five, whatever we decided to talk about with food. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but for now, we... We are going to get into some games. That's what we're here for. Uh, so right now there is a game called Neverland Rescue designed by Scott Alms of Tiny Epic fame, uh, which is on Kickstarter right now. We're going to get into that. We're also going to get into um, a game called Groves. Uh, is Groves the first published game from Lateman or do you have uh, some? No, Groves is, I think, my fifth. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, okay. I, I have quite a few now. And so, but Groves was probably my biggest so there far. So yeah. that's why, I mean, most people now would know me because of that. Mm. Okay. So we'll get into that. That is also available on the Kickstarter uh, via pledge if you want to go over and check that out. So we'll get into both. Uh, but before we do that, you know how we roll on this show. Uh, we are about the people uh, and then we are about the game. So, so we get that order right. So if you could uh, be good enough to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you get into gaming and then we'll go from there. Sure. Yeah. So my name is Dan Letzring. I am a I, I'm a husband, a father, a scientist. I I have two young daughters, three wait, and five. Wait. And oh, scientist? Oh. Whoa, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I went to grad school. I got my PhD in biophysics, and um, wow. so yeah, I did that. I did uh, lab research, and so I've been doing been in that field for a long time now, and. Um, yeah, so then I'm, I'm married. I have a fantastic wife who's very supportive of my company and my hobbies, and she helps out a lot with playtesting games, playing games, packing games, shipping games, pretty much everything involved that we do. And um, two lovely daughters who I you know, spend most of my time not when I'm making games with, and they love playing games too, which is great. And so, yeah, um, so that's kind of the short list of me and what I'm all about. Mm -hmm. um, I've gotten to games maybe 10 years ago now, I want to say, um, like m mainstream hobby games. I've been into games since I was a kid. I'm um, growing up playing like Stratego and Risk and mm -hmm. all of those, but I got into really like hobby games about 10 years ago, I'd say. And yeah, I've been really interested in it and playing ever since. So yeah, 10 years ago would have been the time because that was pandemic. That was Dominion. That yep. was Dixit. So yeah. <laughs> yep. Carcassonne and all those. Yep. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And uh, so I really want to ask you about the scientist thing. Yes, I know people. <laughs> I need to get onto the game at some point, but like the scientist thing, is that like is there an overlap there? Do you know, are you able to kind of bring the hobby to, or like you know even games that are based on it? Because I know there's a couple. Like you know, I, I love this game called Planetarium and everything. So if you find any overlap there, so I've thought about it. I um I've wanted to do games themed on that, but I haven't really designed or or done much with it. So Genius Games does a great job with it. They do games about DNA translation and transcription and how the cell works. And so they do a really good job with it. And actually, that's pretty cool. And I, originally, when I first started getting into it, was thinking about doing something like that. But I don't know, I really got into really my, my second game I did that was like my first kind of mainstream game was a, a family game about dinosaurs. And like, I'm really passionate about family games and 
whimsical and exciting themes like that so i kind of strayed away from the boring science stuff when i got into my games <laughs> just just because of that i really love like i mean my inspirations would be like jim henson and dr susan things that are like in- imaginative and inspiring um in that sense so i kind of strayed away from the science to get more into the whimsical i guess mm. you would call it all right yeah i know um so genius games you're looking at games like cytosis and Covalence yeah. and yeah some of those are really cool games i'm going to be reviewing covalence at some point in the next month or two so yeah fun oh, fun little oh i look forward game. to it because i haven't played that one yet i've played most of their others but that one i haven't had a chance to check out yet and uh our good friend ricky royal made a solo mode for cytosis oh cool so uh yeah <laughs> walking right into our uh, wheelhouse here over here yeah That's yeah really yeah awesome. and I've, I've played that one just not the solo mode i've played cytosis just not not the solo mode Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let us get into Neverland Rescue. So as I was saying at the jump, this is an asymmetrical uh, two player only game. Uh, maybe you can tell, tell us a little bit about the basic way it works and we can go from there. Sure. Yep. So it's two players and each have very different goals. So one is Peter Pan and one is Captain Hook. And Peter Pan is more set collection driven. So Peter Pan gets a secret goal card at the beginning of the game, and they're either trying to rescue five fairies, five mermaids, or five lost boys by the end of the game. And Captain Hook doesn't know which one Pan is going for to kind of, um, he has to kind of sneak around Captain Hook to rescue the people without Hook being able to catch him when he's trying to do it. Um, but Pan also has a, a set of abilities of characters that he has. So it's really a lot of like time management, uh, action management, and um trying to discern, you know, when to get card actions over actually rescuing people who he can use to set, collect his sets to win the game. Um, and he's trying to do all this while kind of being coy and avoiding Hook during the game. Captain Hook has a big deduction aspect. So there are 10 different hideouts that Peter Pan can have in front of him, and he gets five at the beginning of the game. And so Captain Hook's goal is to guess which five of the ten hideouts Peter Pan has. And so throughout the game, Captain Hook is getting clues. Um, it's not, I, I say, it's kind of like Mastermind, if you remember that game, but it's not not really like that. But um, basically there are clues. So each hideout has certain icons on it, like water or mountains or plains or um, different icons. And so Captain Hook may get a card that's a water symbol, and Pan has to put how many tokens related to how many water locations he has and from all the clues captain hook gets throughout the game he starts to discern which five locations pan has and so it's a really fun deduction element we tried to balance it so that um if players love deduction they can play captain hook and it's it's a great brain burner but if they hate it um one of our reviewers eric yurko said he loves set collection so he played just as pan and he loved that end of it and it was great because if you have two people with very different tastes in games you can balance out which one is plays which character and you can both enjoy it instead of just being like oh we don't like this style so we don't like this game you know it kind of balances for both yeah so um, what am i that's one of the things i noticed in the game like that the differing levels of complexity like one of my favorite game favorite games is i don't know if you've heard of it it's called the ravens of three shahashri it's um it's a, a like Japanese game. Mosby brought it over, and it's like if you play as one player, you're basically doing all this stuff and you're calculating and all and, the, and whatever. But if you're playing as the quote unquote um, the the passive player, I guess you're trying. Mm-hmm. You know, one one person is the rescue or one person is being rescued. If you're playing as the one that's being rescued, you don't do a lot. You're just kind of observing the other person, and then you're just kind of like giving subtle hints and clues. So it's like really asymmetrical and i love playing i love being the other thing that my whatever my partner is not so like if my partner is the gamer version it's like okay here go go have fun but if my partner wants to just kind of like you know be subtle and everything then i'll just you know kind of flip the roles sounds like this this is what you're trying to offer here yeah, and actually, I found the same way. Some people play it, and they're like, oh, I love Pan, and some are like, oh, I love playing as Hook, and I feel like I like both. Like you said, I just like playing whatever the other person isn't, and just, I, I don't know, I enjoy both both ends of it, but yeah, it started, you know, we made some design choices to kind of even the playing field, um, because, you know, with the deduction, it was harder for Hook, so we made some other design choices to kind of balance that out but what it did was put a little bit more of the mental load on hook as well Mm. and as we started doing that we realized like it really it works for you know adult adult gamer gamer against each other but it also really balances like if there's a parent and a child playing the parent can play hook which is going to be a little bit harder with the deduction and the kid can play as pan which is a little more straightforward in the set collection and it really balances the playing field for them as well um going through with that so it 
it it worked out really well in a in a way we were kind of surprised by and yeah we loved the way it really pulled the two roles apart and made it very asymmetric Mm -hmm. okay so um also one of my favorite games in this I don't know what you would call it. It is kind of a deduction thing, but it's not alone. Have you played that game? Yes. Okay. So that's like my ideal game of like trying to find out what's going on, getting the other person's head. Uh, how much, am, how close am I when it comes to that comparison? Um, so a little bit. Yeah. So, so, so the way it works, you know, there are three tracks of cards that, that the players can choose from. And what they're going to do is pan secretly picks where he wants to take cards from and hook takes you know then chooses where he wants to go and take cards from um and sometimes it's good for hook to catch pan because um you know certain things happen but then they only get one card each so you get less clues but um he exhausts one of pan's abilities and you know he gets a clue for one of pan's hideouts but if they go to separate locations they both get two cards so it's really kind of on hook to think do i want pan to get more cards that aren't really useful for him this round or do i want to trap him and go to the same location as him which you know which cards do i think he's going to want because hook draws six cards and picks where those cards go for the locations so he's trying to bait pan or make sure hook gets the clues he wants and goes away from pan you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so so there is a lot of that trying to get in his mind and think what's best for pan this round do i want to trap him do i not and even still he may not and he might not have a clue what pan's going for so but then pan has to think that too what's what's hook getting at with this round what is he trying to trying to do to me do i want to avoid him or just go for my goals and you Mm -hmm. know so there's a lot of that which is great it's a lot of fun right so like i guess that so from the hook perspective it might be that with that kind of not alone vibe where it's like you're trying to figure out where they are. But exactly. then from the player perspective, it's more this set collection aspect and all that. Yeah, and trying to just gauge what Hook is doing and where, you know, what, what Hook's plotting and if he's onto what you're trying to collect this round. And yeah, so mm-hmm. it, yeah, there's a lot of that mental game through it, which is fun. Uh, another game, I know I'm doing a lot of comparisons, but like I just like to kind of locate games. If that oh, makes no, that's sense. cool. Yeah, that's um, great. So theme wise, and I met, I heard, I know that Ito mentioned this in his preview. Um, theme wise, it kind of evokes the Grim Forest, which is a recent game from Druid City Games. That game is kind of chock full of whimsy, and it's chock, and not just like uh, that whimsical, like you were saying before, but like there's a lot of like kind of take that, and there's a lot of like gotcha, that kind of thing. Is that also kind of what you were going for with the with the kind of direct interactions? So so for the theme, really, I've been wanting to make a pan game for, for a long time now. Um, and it kind of actually just happened by chance. So Scott and I originally were talking about Boston Tea Party, and that's where this game came from. So it was originally, mm-hmm. instead of collecting Neverland Inhabitants, you were Sam Adams trying to throw tea in the harbor at Boston Harbor. And the other character was the captain of the guard. And, you know, we realized that this theme wasn't probably exciting for a lot of people. And so... Uh, we were trying to think what to do, and I had always wanted to do a Peter Pan game. And Scott and I had separately both talked about always wanting to work with Jackie Davis, who does great mm-hmm. children's lit art. So it just kind of made sense with the theme and the gameplay style and the artist we wanted to work with. So it kind of fell into place like that, and it actually really um, completed the game. Like It really finalized some of the mechanics and how the game worked. Um, and so it wasn't it, – it was kind of fortuitous, but it wasn't – plan from the beginning so to speak yeah (laughs) okay uh so like how did that work that's that's interesting how did that work initially with the throwing the the tea like were you was was Um, it like the boston governor like looking for the different revolutionaries and yeah so instead of the three locations in neverland there were three different boats because with the boston tea party there were three different boats that the uh sons of liberty were boarding and so one character was trying to get on one boat that had tea on it and throw it in the river basically collect the card so that's where the set collection came in oh. and and the captain of the guard which was the other player had to find your five hidden hideouts that the, the sons of liberty were hiding in throughout boston mm-hmm. and so um it had the same same gameplay for the most part there were some changes obviously but um but yeah so then the sam adams player who was the sons of liberty was trying to get the t and the captain of the guard from you know the soldiers was trying to capture them and make sure they didn't throw it in the harbor I, I want to play that. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I'm an American history guy, so <laughs> that sounds so, so much fun. Yeah, well, so I'm originally from Boston, and that's why when uh, Scott and I were talking, I was like, oh, I'd love to publish a Tea Party themed game. And he was like, I kind of have a game that might work for that. And that's mm. that's how this whole thing started was us just talking one time about it. And he was just like, yeah, try this out. And so, yeah, it worked out pretty well. All right. Well, that is all of my questions for Neverland Rescue. Is there anything else that you wanted to share before we moved on? 
Um, no, I think we covered a lot of it. But yeah, if anyone has any questions for it too, they can reach out to me, and you know, I'm pretty accessible online, so I'm happy to answer any questions ever anyone has for it. Awesome. So let's get into another game. You you mentioned that this is kind of one of your more popular games, but you know, just in case people out there don't know it, uh, let's talk a little bit about Grows, which is also available on the Kickstarter. Uh, sure. So maybe you can tell me a little about a little bit about this bag building worker placement adventure. Yeah. So Grows is a bag building worker placement, as you said, where uh, players are are drawing from a pool of spirits or fairies or fae um, that tap their you know energy from the land, and so um, it it has this worker placement aspect where the tiles you're playing on have a generic ability you get from it. But if you compare the right type of spirit with the right land type, you get like a bonus action or ability along with it. Um, so it's really if you can optimize the bag you're building to the places you're trying to place. You'll edge out your opponents by kind of just optimizing your turns, getting more resources, getting more mm-hmm. actions, because you're pairing the proper workers with the proper locations. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we really tried to focus on the bag building. So there are actions like if you play in other people's lands, which you can, you have to build portals to do it. But if you play in their lands and you use a worker that's going to gain you the bonus actions, everything that's placed in your land, whether you place it or someone else does, goes in your own bag at the end of it. So. Mm-hmm. If I place a spirit in your land, you're going to get it for the next round. And so I might send a good one to get a good action that turn, but then you'll have it to use. Or I'll use it to call my bag and get rid of some spirits I don't want by sending them to your bag or the main. The center board also allows you to call your bag as well. So it really focuses on that refinement. Um, and then there are bonuses too that are bonus on the draws that you pull out of the bag. So you draw three spirits out of the bag, and there are bonuses related to the combinations of spirits you draw. So we really wanted it to be related to like your bag, how well you refine it, how you build it, and have that kind of interact with everything that's going on in the game. So um, from the description, it might sound like this is a complicated game. <laughs> this, is, this is, again, a family weight game, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not too complicated, but I mean, it's definitely more complicated than most of the other games that we've put out. Um, yeah, it's kind of, I'd say it's a mid-weight game. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, and now uh, why the bag? So, I mean, it it feels like a deck builder, right? Or you could have done, uh, there's all sorts of different ways, like this pool building or whatever it is. Is there something about the bag that kind of got you? And it's like, okay, um, you know, I have all these spirits and the spirits are kind of key to these these things. Like, what's the difference between having a deck full of water that I can play on a, you know, Mm -hmm. a water space as opposed to like a bag full of minis or chits? Um, Well, so yeah, so we wanted the workers to be like chit size that you're placing on the tiles, but also... With the at the end of the round, everything played in your area goes back in and gets kind of remixed up. So it'd almost be like if you're in a deck builder, you played some cards, people played cards towards you, and then you reshuffled your deck every round. So you would just be reshuffling every round because when you pull out, they don't stay out till you go through your whole bag. Everything goes back in and gets reshuffled. So the 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 bag makes it easier for that. Okay, I, th- I thought of it like couriers. So like in couriers, mm-hmm. you yeah. roll and then they kind of stay in like a, a, a like a I forget what it's called, like a graveyard or whatever it is. And then mm-hmm. you kind of empty the bag and kind of sweep everything in. So I, so you so this is a, a straight up refresh every time. Yeah, and so Orleans kind of does something like that too. They you know if you have some you don't play, they kind of go into a reserve area and you can go through it till you get everything. Um, but this, yeah, this one, every time, things placed in your own area, whether you place them or someone else does, get mixed right back in your bag every time. So that's why I mentioned that the refinement is really important because, mm-hmm. you know, you might want 7 to 10 spirits in your bag. You don't want to get up to 15 because then you never know where you're going to get out. But if you get down to 3 and then you need to send one away, you're going to run out of spirit. You know, it's it's a yeah. really delicate balance to finding that sweet spot of how many spirits you need with, while still getting the ones you need, you know. Mm-hmm. And you got a whole bunch of games that are available, uh, at least on a, at a certain pledge level. So you want to tell, maybe kind of run through some of those? Um, yep. So one of my other games is Dino Dude Ranch. That's a family weight um, resource. Uh, it's a set collection resource management game. You're basically rolling dice to collect meat, leaves, and fish. And you use them to buy dinosaurs based on what they like to eat. Um, so there are four dinosaurs available in the main market area. And um, players have hidden bonuses. And there's a deck of cards that allow you to get, like, discount dinosaurs or swapping resources so so it's really weighted so you're going to roll a lot of leaves and herbivores are going to come out more but they're worth less points so Mm -hmm. the cards help you kind of manipulate so you get the higher valued foods and um and we just added a new expansion which all the reviewers really loved because it added 
enough complexity that it adds another layer of depth to it without changing the game. So now you're buying babies, you buy eggs, and if you compare them with their their parent dinosaurs, you can hatch them and earn basically bonus points for the parents as you're doing it. So it's kind of waiting, mm-hmm. spending your resources on dinosaurs or babies, or if you have resources you don't want, instead of buying the cards now, you can buy the eggs. And so there's a lot of fun decisions with this little you know lightweight family game. And mm-hmm. we have some rules variants, so it's great that it works down to like age four, but with the game as it is, it's like about seven or eight plus, I'd mm-hmm. say, to start. But really, you know, when you strip it down to its core and get rid of some of the cards, it's, you know, good for four plus and stuff, which is a lot of fun. Very cool. All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you can get all this. Go over to the Kickstarter for Neverland Rescue. Uh, it'll be live as we post the episode for about another week, week or 10 days or so. So uh, hopefully that you guys got a lot of information, uh, enough information to figure out whether this is worth your hard earned cash. Thank you so much, Dan. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on. It was really great talking to you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and cut it right there for the episode. Uh, Thank you to Dan for joining us, and thank you as well uh, for listening. So after the jump, we are going to get into a very silly conversation about just food. (laughs) Yes. Uh, We list our top five international foods that we just love all, you know, so much. So I don't know. We just felt like uh, messing around. It was just that kind of evening uh, where the two of us just wanted to hang out. Go ahead and listen to that. But if you just want to go ahead and skip that, then that's okay. Uh, We will see you next week. So, um, yeah, if you wanted to reach out to us, whether you are a person who is a Kickstarter backer and you are finding projects that you would like us to feature on the show, or if you're a Kickstarter project manager and you want a little bit of free publicity, yes, I do this for free. All I ask is for a half hour of your time, maybe 45 minutes, depending on the game. Uh, So, yeah, I'll very much willing to take a look and see if it's a good fit for the show. So you can reach out to me at ENGN underscore podcast on the Twitter. Um, I am user Pope Sixtus on BGG. You can find us at boardgamesanonymous.com or everynightisgamenight.com. That is uh, the same site, basically, on the same server. Uh, You can also please, please, please rate us. Go to the iTunes store. uh, Give us five stars or however many stars you think we deserve. Uh, That really, really helps the show, really, really helps the exposure for the games that we were talking about on the previous series and also for our regular episodes as well. All right. Until next time, this is Jason signing off. Later, everybody. All right, so let's see what do we got here. Uh, so what are your what? Do you, so just break down some of your favorites. Oh, actually, you know what? Let's let's do this. How um, are you like an international eater? A uh, like a, a domestic kind of meat and potatoes type? type oh guy? no, I'll eat anything. <laughs> I, I'm yeah, I'm definitely an international eater. I'll eat I'll eat whatever's in front of me for sure. Okay, so so that let's do that. Let's do top five international. Uh, like you could just like throw stuff on though. You don't have to rank them or anything. It's like you know, just think, think of five, five uh things that we should all that that you recommend that should that should be tried. <laughs> okay. Oh uh, man, I'm gonna have to think about that. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm writing them down. Have you traveled a lot? Um, a little bit. I've been, you know, so outside of the U.S., I've been to. Italy, Scotland, mm-hmm. Puerto Rico, okay, can- Canada. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Canada. Oh man, this is tough. <laughs> this is tough. I'm not going. Although uh, there is a Canadian dish that is on my list right here. Is there? Uh, yes, so there you, is. are you doing dishes? Yeah, I mean it could be it could be whatever. You know, we're just making this up as we go along. So whatever you whatever you you fancy. Okay. Okay. Hold on. All right, that should be good. All right. Maybe. <laughs> I have four. I'm like, I can come up with a fifth while we're yeah, talking. Yeah, there you go. 
All right. So actually, I'll, I'll go first. The Canadian one that I have is a nice poutine. Mm, poutine is really good. My wife is obsessed with poutine too. She oh, we have. Um, I have. So I have one of my clients. I'm a psychotherapist, and he's thinking. Of, he's a French Canadian dude, and he's thinking about opening a food truck. And he's like, yeah, they're pretty expensive. And I'm like, no. <laughs> just, just do it. Just do it. Park right outside my office. Yeah. Um, yeah, We so we, we have a, a lot of food trucks in our area. And one of our more popular ones in our city here is called Le Petit Poutine. Mm. And it's a it's pretty good. Yeah, they're, they're where really you, good. Where around, where around are you? I'm in uh, Rochester, New York. So it's western oh, New York. Wow. Pretty much near okay. Toronto. Yeah, so yeah, near I Canada. I know what Rochester is. I'm yeah. in I'm in Connecticut, so I'm in not too far. Uh, yeah, not too far. What part of Connecticut are you? Uh, right now, I'm near New Haven. Okay. Yeah, I have friends who live in. Uh, I think they're in Stamford. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a little bit further down. <laughs> it's either there or Stratford. I know they're in one of them too. <laughs> so similar sounding. I don't know which one they're in. I think it's all right. Stamford, so, uh, okay. so hit me. So we'll go back and forth. Like, uh, so get, give me uh, some um, food. Some, some food you like to enjoy. Okay, one of my favorites is I love stuffed poblano peppers. There we go. So, like, mm. maybe stuff with, like, so there's a place near me that does, like, it's almost like a, a tender pulled chicken that's stuffed in the poblano, and it's so good. And so I love stuffed poblanos. Mm-hmm. So I'm Puerto Rican. I'm going to have to go uh, with a Puerto Rican dish. I'm going to have to go with a nice, juicy penil. Uh, that's, that's a, but they call it a pork shoulder. Uh-huh. Uh, with the arroz con gandules, which is the rice and the chickpeas and everything. I mean, I'm just uh, like, th- that is like home cooking to me. And I'm such a snob about it. Like, I can't eat it. That's that's one of those things I cannot eat off a food truck or if I can't eat off a restaurant. Right. Like, if it's like, not like how how mom makes it or something like that, it's or not like a family same. thing. Yes. And, it's, and it's like, oh, okay. This is a, like, what, that's when you know it's like, okay, <laughs> just so, get over yourself. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> um, so, my dad lived in Puerto Rico for 30 years. So, I've been a couple of times. And so, I haven't had that, but I, I, I used to go and they used to have, when we'd go, these things, they were called papas. And mm-hmm. they were like kind of fried balls of potato stuffed with meat. Oh. And they, they, they were, so it was basically like it was almost like the taste of like, you know, like the McDonald's hash browns that would like ground meat stuffed inside. And it was mm-hmm. just amazing. It was so good. It was just like this deliciously fried potato with ground meat in it. And it was oh, I remember that distinctly. And that was so good. That was one of my favorite things when we go visit them <laughs> it's funny we're doing this as a top five list and we're na- naming like 20 things <laughs> oh yeah i mean this is not, yeah we could go That's on awesome. for the next hour um That's okay awesome. so you want to talk home cooking Let's um, do it. for me i'm putting for me i'm part lebanese and so mm. for me anything right grandmother made we do stuff grape leaves and um that's one of my favorite things in the world um or we have another thing called kibbe which is like ground meat with bulgur wheat and um I love that. I pretty much anything, really. I mean, anything that they make. But yeah, so any Lebanese food is definitely in my top five. I've never had a Lebanese, a real Lebanese dish. That's one of the, that's what has escaped me, unfortunately. Well, if you ever come to Rochester, New York, I'll make you one. Well, there you go. All right. Just in case I want to hang out in the sun and the fun. Oh, my goodness. We get three days of sun a year, mostly snow, 80% of the year. It's awful. Oh, was, oh man, yeah. I I went to University of Buffalo for a little while. I I'm good. I'm oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. My wife is from Buffalo originally, so that's about yeah an hour from here. So you went uh, there to UB for four years? No, no, no I went for like a month. Oh, it, yeah. <laughs> didn't didn't quite work out. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, like I saw the sun, then the cloud descended, and I'm like, I right, get me away from this cloud. I'm just, I'm gonna re- <laughs> I can't take this. this anymore. Yeah, I can't, I can't do it. My skin. <laughs> Um, number three for me, I'm going to go the dessert route. So I've had the the pleasure of being, going to Italy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went to, um, you know, this was on my baby moon. So like kind of a last hurrah before we'd never leave the house again. Uh-huh. And, uh, going to have to go with Italian gelato. Oh yes. my God. We, we did basically did. So my wife, I'm a, I'm like a religion guy. So I went to the Vatican. I had a great time. My wife's a foodie. So we did literally, I think in five days, we did 11 gelato stands and places. I couldn't. Ugh. We So, so, <laughs> so good. funny enough, we did the exact same thing before we had our first daughter. We did a delayed honeymoon after our, we got married. And then about six months later, we went on our honeymoon. And then we had our daughter about six months after that. And so we went to Italy also for our baby moon. Well, there you go. And We're giving listeners ideas over here. I know, right? And it was amazing. We did the same thing. Every meal, we had to find at least, for me, one 
place with pizza because pe- that's on my list and i'm gonna hit it right now pizza i love any kind of pizza um, and people are like just pizza that's it <laughs> yeah i'm like they're like what do you like better thin crust or thick crust and my answer is thin crust but that doesn't mean thick crust is bad because it's still right. pizza it's still delicious right. it's just different levels of delicious but yeah everywhere we went we had to try pizza in every city and every place we went to and she had to try gelato in every city and every place we went to mm-hmm. well, um so okay there's this popular theory that with pizza and bagels like bready stuff in particular like you like people think that the stuff they grew up with is like the best like you can't convince them otherwise like if i if you grew up in st louis and you had the, like the st louis like wafer pizza or whatever they have there mm-hmm. then if you go to new york you're not going to think that's awesome pizza because like you're going to like it but it, you're not gonna, you're going to be like oh no no it's not as good as this other thing like is that something that you buy into or is, or can i convince people definitely because i feel like I'm that way, and I know a lot of people who are there. Like, I have a good friend from Chicago, and he loves deep dish. And I'm just like, there you go. I don't get it. I, I mean, I like <laughs> it, but it's definitely not better than the other pizzas I know of. Yep. So, so yeah, I mean, I definitely get that, and I definitely I, I buy into that for sure. Yeah, so, okay, so, so yeah. while mm-hmm. we touched on that, pizza was on my list, so so you can go again. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yes. I mean, I like – Okay, so New York kind of pizza and bagels, I guess that'll be my number two. Like I, I, I will gravitate towards a good bagel shop. Like I need like I need the thing the big I need the, the bagel to be so big that the, there's no hole, like it just kinda of grows into the middle. And uh, you know, I need my locks. <laughs> just the whole the whole shebang. Like people who don't know what a good New York bagel is are missing out. Please do yourself a favor once in your life. Just go hit up a place. <laughs> You know, have yourself a sandwich, have yourself, you know, some, get some salmon on there, whatever you got to do. It's, it, it's just amazing. See, here I'm going to have to disagree with you. The first one no, I disagree no. with you on, I don't love, like, I'll eat a bagel, but I don't love it. And I, I, oh, and fish and lox and things like that. Not, I, I mean, that's one of the few things I don't eat any of. Mm. So, so I'm gonna... you grew up landlocked, too. <laughs> well, no, I grew up in Boston, actually. So, oh, okay. but I, I actually do like, like, I'll eat shellfish and things of that nature, clam chowder, and I mean, clams and crab or any of that stuff, but I just don't like fish, <laughs> like mm. salmon, uh, yeah, whatever, anything, tuna, none of it. I will. So, all right. Do you got, yeah. you got another one for me? Um, yeah. So, I love it. Most Thai dishes, I love mm. anything with like that involves kind of like a coconut milk and curry mix. <laughs> mm-hmm. thing, you know what I, <laughs> I mean? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I love it. And I love, I mean, just, yeah, anything like that with, you know, tofu or chicken and some sort of noodle. And I am sold. I love, I mean, the richness of the coconut milk and anything else. And so, yeah, really, most Thai dishes, I am down for. And I love hot. So, the mm-hmm. hotter, the better. So, for me, that, you know, that's definitely going to be on there. See, for me, the spicy, like, so I'm Puerto Rican, so we don't eat spicy food. Like, we, it's mostly, like, you know, flavored yes. food. So yep. I, you know, when I dated a Mexican girl, she was making a lot of spicy food, so I kind of, like, lean that way. Mm-hmm. But still, man, I mean, when it comes to, like, Thai spicy, I, I literally cannot taste what's happening. It, it is, I don't, it is <laughs> be, totally beyond me. <laughs> it has a little pepper on the menu. I'm like, nope, I don't care. I don't You're care like, if it's I, soup. I don't care if it's anything. Just, just no. Yeah, if they picture the pepper at all, you just stay away from it. I'm like, give me the double pepper. Once I went to an Indian restaurant and they were like, how hot do you want? I was like, I want it pretty hot. And she looks at me and she says, do you want it American hot or Indian hot? And I was like, <laughs> Indian hot's fine. That's, that's okay. Yep. So, yeah. Nice. So I like it as hot as I can get it. Nice. So, so my number one over here, and this is number one. So this is like um, adventure food. This is like this. This to me is like ambrosia. So I spent a month in Beijing when I was a kid. Uh, when I was a college student, kid. Uh, so I was a college student. I was studying abroad, whatever. The the street vendors selling the dumplings, and it's just straight up dumplings. In Chinese, it's jiaozi, and I learned how to. That was like my only Chinese that I remember was jiaozi. <laughs> just going and and they like they had they have they count numbers with like Hansible so like I would do the the Hansible for ten uh-huh. and just every single and I would just like do it like thirty times. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I I have everywhere I go, every city in America I visit, every place you know if I'm going or you know if I go back to Canada, every single place I go, I'm on a massive manhunt for a comparable, chi- a good Chinese dumpling. And maybe it's just to the point where, like, I'm romanticizing it so much because this was in, like, 2000, 18 years ago. I, and maybe my brain just remembers it so much better than it was, but I can't. I, I, I It was – I just remember, like, just rolling in them and just – and it was so delicious and the sauce and everything. Oh, my God. Chinese dumplings just <sighs> – That's amazing. <laughs> 
So unfortunately, I already hit on my number ones and twos because we were just going out of order with, you know what I mean, with our stories. So I actually only picked them. Those are my four favorites. Those are my four most memorable and top things I eat. And so everything what, else I like, but it's just like, all right, you know, I don't know. What's the what's the strangest thing you've ever eaten? Oh, the strangest thing I've ever eaten. Mm-hmm. Any, any <sighs> weird animal or anything like that? No, I mean, I haven't had anything super weird. I mean, I've had, like, buffalo meat, which is, you know, not that weird. Yeah. Um, no, I can't think of anything super strange I've eaten. How about you? Uh, go, on, go to China. That list will fill up nice and fast. Oh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> they eat anything. <laughs> if it has meat on it, they don't. They it, could yeah, not going less. Down. Oh, You yeah. can, like, okay, so I will admit that I have eaten dog before. Oh, man, was so, it good? No, it was terrible. It was like spongy and Ew. tasteless, and yeah. And, I'm like, and I ask them, I say, "Okay, what is this? What am I eating?" And they're like, um, "Pit bull." <laughs> You're just like what? Because <laughs> they they had the Chinese characters, like they had like the little translator, so they would like put the Chinese characters in the translator. Oh, okay. And the translator would say out "pit bull." It's like, oh my, oh god. my gosh. Oh. <laughs> I would probably I'll never do that right again. There. <laughs> I love eating, but that would make me throw up. I know, right? Well, I mean, this has been so much fun. I thank you for very much for indulging me in my silliness. No, I am. I had a great time. Anytime you need a guest, be sure to let me know. I'm happy to do this again. Awesome. All right. So, uh, cool. We're, we're going to wrap it up here. Yep. Uh, I will...